Awesome. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Beth. Uh, thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Gigi, for calling me back again. I was surprised, but I'm happy. All right. So I know Dr. Kinney talked about some nice, uh, sexy heart, sexy valves. We'll talk about the real thing, the sexy legs. All right. So uh, I have no financial relationship. I have a GoFundMe account, if you can, but uh, we'll go from there. So this is what it is. Just to give you a background, varicose veins, venous insufficiency, whatever you want to call it, is pretty much very much more prevalent than what you actually see in relation to coronary artery disease, in relation to peripheral arterial disease. It's one of those problems which actually exist, but people don't really think much about it because they think, ah, maybe, maybe not. Should I do anything about it or not? Because nobody really dies because of varicose veins. But essentially, if you look at it, it's a, it's a large uh, incidence and prevalence of the disease. More than one million actually have venous ulcers, which is the advanced stage of the disease. A lot, it, it, it's a very expensive disease to have, anywhere between 150 to a billion dollar estimated of chronic venous insufficiency. Uh, almost 70 to 90 percent are pretty much venous ulcers. So if you see a patient in your office, in your clinic, in the hospital who has ulcers in his legs, do, I mean, I'm sure the first reflex is to make sure there is no real arterial disease, but always think about venous being a concomitant or maybe a primary etiology in what the ulcers are happening. Because a lot of patients would keep coming in and they become frustrated that it's not getting fixed because we're not actually looking at the real disease, which is the venous ulceration. So just to make clarify, varicose veins are not spider veins. The ones you see, because they're more cosmetic. So you know how if a young lady or a young gentleman comes in and says, I have these fine veins on my legs, those are by definition not varicose veins. They're pretty much like spider veins, which are more of a cosmetic issue. And it does affect all age groups, gender, and race. This is essentially the prevalence of approximately 30 million, and the people who actually get treated is just half a million, which is, like, which is significant. So only not many people know about it, so not many people really get treated about it. So it's a very uh, a big conundrum we are actually in. And if, like I was saying, the venous reflux is actually five times, two times more prevalent than heart disease, and five times more prevalent than peripheral arterial disease. It's just out there, but have to look for it. And this is just just to give you an overview of how significant the problem is. What are the risk factors? Whom should you actually look for, think about, uh, discuss with the patient? Anybody who's almost more than 40 years old. Gender, more commonly in females, especially after pregnancy. The youngest I've seen in my own practice is a 19-year-old girl who got pregnant. Uh, and then two years after pregnancy, she had significant varicose veins. Somebody who's a smoker, heavy lifter, prolonged stirring, which we all essentially do. Well, overweight people and, of course, like I said, multiple pregnancies. So good thought to keep in mind. And this is a normal uh, uh, spectrum of how the disease is. You can easily see some spider veins if they initially come to your office. You can also see some skin color changes. You'll see patients who come in like, oh, I'm having this darkening of skin around my shin area for like around four, year of, like four months to a year. It doesn't bother me, but it's there. You could have swelling or if it gets worse, you can have uh, sores and ulcers. So always good to talk to patients about her or elicit, try to elicit the symptoms, saying, do you have heaviness, burning, achiness, fatigue, cramping? Because most of the times we just shove it off saying, oh, it's just muscle pain and nothing else, or it's just a swelling because I'm standing for a long time. But there has to be a cause to it, and this is exactly what the cause is. So just to give you an overview of anatomy, if you hear about or if you see reports on patients who come back with venous ultrasound, what's GSV, what's SSV, it's essentially the greater saphenous vein and the small saphenous vein we're looking for. These are more the superficial veins we talk about. The main vein is the femoral vein, which actually goes up and forms the iliac vein and then eventually the IVC. But it's essentially the greater saphenous and the small saphenous veins, which are real culprit in all these patients. So we always have to consider them and read their reports when they are. So they become significant in venous disease. And connecting these two veins, the deeper vein, which is the femoral vein, and the superficial, the greater saphenous vein, are the perforator veins, which essentially carry blood to the main system back up to the heart. These are some of the branches which you don't have to really think about, but they're always good to consider, especially when you're doing an intervention. So why does it happen? What's the thought process? What's the physiology behind venous insufficiency? This, If you remember this chart, this helps. It's a good visual visualization of the disease process for you and actually for the patient itself. So 
normally you know that the blood goes from the feet back up to the heart in one direction with competent valves. But when, dis when you have any of these risk factors of presentation, the problem is the veins become weak, the valves become destroyed, and the blood, instead of going back up, it actually starts to leak back down. So slowly and slowly, as in how the disease progresses, you start to have worsening of symptoms such as swelling, discoloration, pain, edema, or ulceration if it's left untreated. So it's mainly the blood going back in the wrong direction is what's causing all your problem. So this is pretty much highlights how the disease progresses. Initially, it's a focal dilatation, then it gets even worse, varicosity, and then eventually aneurysm. So the treatment essentially, like I'll talk down the lane, is closing those veins off to help it. And this is one of the few uh, pictures you might see in like in a clinic. Initially, when they come in, is these spider reticular veins, which is essentially a staging. So uh, it's the first stage of uh, your venous insufficiency. We call it the CEAP classification. Not that it goes in order from one to six, but it's, you could come in directly with a class 3 or a class 2, or class 3 might go back to 2 and 1. So it's not a, 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 a gradation of uh, escalation of disease, it's just a presentation, and that's how we mark it. So class 2 is where you come in with these prominent varicosities, which I'm sure you see in a lot of patients in your clinic. Class 3 is edema. So you could have an edema without the veins. So let's say a patient comes in for the lower leg swelling. Of course, you want to make sure there's no heart failure involved, there are no other cirrhotic or liver issues or kidney issues, but it's always good to consider having venous insufficiency as a contributing factor because you, we keep giving these, I see a lot of patients, primary care, they give Lasix, hydrochlorothiazide, it helps them transiently, but that's not a long-term solution. So it's always good to consider at the back of your mind if there's any venous insufficiency that's that's adding to my edema problem. And this is just the, further down the lane, class four is mainly pigmentation and eczema. Class four B is more of sclerotic changes and then you start going into the ulcer category. Uh, so how to differentiate between arterial and venous ulceration? Always an important point, always a good point, easy clinical characteristics. It's not classic 100%, but it's a good guidance to see what it can. So arterial mainly, as you know, it's the toes or the foot, irregular margin. You have associated cold limb or non-palpable pulses or severe pain or worse pain with walking. While in venous ulceration, it's more a little bit more proximally, so above the feet, around the malleolar region, lateral side, medial side, or the shin. The, the feet are usually warm and actually swollen rather than dried up and shriveled. And there, of course, the pain variation is very skeptical. The pain is more worse at the end of the day if your feet are down on the ground, and the patient says that the symptoms improve when I get up in the morning because your feet have been elevated all throughout when you're sleeping. So it's very important to do a patient assessment and diagnosis, talk to the patient, get their past medical history, do a good physical exam, and all you have to do is just get an a, a detailed venous ultrasound. That's all it needs. It doesn't need different steps of diagnosis. One test makes a confirmatory diagnosis and you're done. And you can do whatever is appropriate for the patient. So that test is essentially a duplex scan, which is a venous ultrasound. Mainly we're looking for a superficial vein uh, incompetencies, like I talked about the greater safness and the small safness vein. And 95% of the times it's very sensitive. So if you, if it's, if, if you have a good tech, of course, and a good uh, patient habitus, which, which could be restricting, most of the time it's very, uh, very specific and very, sen uh, very uh, sensitive. But if you have other concomitant factors, then of course the sensitivity goes down. But so let's see. So the patient comes in. What are we going to do with this patient? We've diagnosed the patient. We know the problem. The patient wants to get it fixed. So we have a lot of strategies present. Conservative treatment is there, which is just symptomatic relief. It does not fix the problem because, like I said, the veins have now dilated, so they're not going to go back. It's not like gaining weight, losing weight. You can go back to your normal size once the veins have become big, they really can't ever go back to their size because the valves are de destroyed. So what we initially start is with conservative therapy, leg elevation, compression stockings, always a good idea from clinical perspective and also from insurance side. If you're planning to do ablation, they want you to do a compression stocking trial. But the problem is it's hard to wear the stockings. We, they are very tight. It's warm, especially it's humid. Patients hate it. And it requires a lengthy treatment. So And it does, like I said, it doesn't fix the problem. But we have to do it as a part of the treatment modality. So once we've done with all your conservative therapy, there are, there are various categories where we can actually fix these veins. And essentially, the treatment is mainly office-based procedure. You could, there are mainly three categories we look at. One is the thermal tumescence, meaning we give lidocaine, normal saline, bicarb mixture. You can actually do a laser closure, which we call the laser ablation. You can do a closure fast or a radio frequency ablation. Or there's a newer technology which nowadays uses another catheter or foam technique, which is a scleroid 
sclero the sclerosing agent. So it actually burns the vein from inside. So the lumen collapses, no more blood flow, no more reflux, we're all taken care of. Or there, there's nowadays, uh, recently it got approved is the venous seal, which is actually glue. So we use the glue to just clog off the vein and just be done with it. Surgical stripping nowadays, we rarely do it. It's not even done for it. It's, it doesn't make any sense anymore. But like any other any other specialty, this specialty actually they did a trial where they had their trial between head-on four ma uh, management strategies. Either we strip, we do a laser ablation, we do sclerotherapy, or radiofrequency ablation. It was a proper 500 patient randomized trial comparing the exact four treatment strategies, which is very rare for uh, somebody to, but they did do it. And they actually followed up the patient at three days, one month, and one year. The primary endpoints were, of course, closing the vein off, which is greater saphenous vein is our, is our target vein for closure. Secondary endpoints were pain, which is the most common presenting symptom for these patients. So we want to make sure these symptoms are treated and it's worth doing the procedure. Scores, the, the and then we have these two uh, uh, severity scores, which is the AVVSS and the C, VCSS scale. So there's just to get a little objective overview. And you can essentially see that Radio frequency did very well, as com so, so was laser. The ultrasound guided flown, to, uh, the, the sclerotherapy was not as effective as, as the, uh, the procedure itself. Of course, the stripping worked great in uh, addition as well. But the whole issue was the pain, because pain is, post-procedure pain is always a concern in which radio frequency was significantly better as compared to the other procedures. So these procedures essentially work. They're great. They're office-based and uh, uh, we can get done in like 15, 20 minutes for it. For phlebectomy, which means essentially removal of the disease veins, is actually done after you do these primary interventions because these are like the leftover veins which can be inflamed, which become painful, sometimes thrombosed, and sometimes bleed. So phlebectomy is more of a secondary uh, treatment, not primary head-on treatment where you see, if you see a the big varicose veins in the leg, you just don't start doing phlebectomy or removal of the veil. You want to fix the underlying cause first, let the vein heal or decrease in size because it's all about the venous pressure, and then you can take these veins out. So just to quickly talk about sclerotherapy, I'm sure uh, a lot of people who have these superficial veins, but they're not that painful, we want to get it. They're like more than, uh, they're used in veins which are less than five millimeters in size. Unfortunately, most of the times uh, it's not covered by insurance, so it, it becomes an issue, but, a most of, but it's a very simple procedure where you use actually a 30 gauge butterfly needle, just the light, we inject it, and we compress, and that's it, and the veins are gone. So the patient is very happy. It's, it's, an, like, it's a quick in and out stuff. And the whole idea is it induces spasm, disperses further, and enhanced sclerosis. So all the veins shuts down, so there is no blood flow in these superficial veins, so you look nice and pretty, and uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's good. And you can see here, this is one of the patients, you can see the superficial spider veins here. We inject the sclerosing agents, and now these veins are all gone. Of course, every, every procedure comes in with its own complications. Foam therapy has its own complications as well. You can have staining, painful tenderness, some embolus, rarely DVT if there's a big connection, if the vein is too big and it connects with the deeper system. Rarely, though, ulceration and anaphylaxis. So now I'm going to talk to you about this laser and RF, which is the most common procedures used, which I'm sure you would probably refer or see your patients who've had these done. So the whole idea is using an optical fiber, which uses laser heat from inside, and it actually induces thermal damage. So it actually causing trauma to the vein from inside. It heats up the tissue, induces thermal injury, the lumen closes, and uh, the the, uh, the uh, insufficiency goes away. And the other aspect from it is uh, the, radi the radio frequency ablation, which is essentially using a radio frequency device. So the heat generated is instead of a 800 degree centigrade heat, it's almost like 120 degree centigrade heat generation in the vein. And it's all done under local anesthesia, so the, we don't need any, uh, what you may call it, any epidurals, any spinals, any general, or anything whatsoever. It's pure local anesthesia. The patient is awake, he actually walks in and walks out. It's a quick 15 minute procedure we do in the office with no uh, recovery time. They actually walk in. Um, like I talk about, like I said, it, it's it's very effective procedure. Ninety-five percent of the veins remain closed at the end of one year. There's relief of symptoms immediately after two days, and it has very positive outcomes with recovery. 
This is one of the trials they did from the radio frequency aspect, and it actually shows that the high occlusion rate of almost 90% at five years, and the reflux free time is 93.7% 93 at, uh, again, five years with minimal complication rate. So this is exactly what we do. We get an access in the vein under the ultrasound, more so around the knee area. We put a seven French sheath in. Then you put a catheter in that vein all the way up to the saphenofemoral junction, because we know the greater saphenous or the small saphenous, if you're doing, to the saphenopop Tail junction and we pull back three centimeters because you know we're causing destruction and trauma to the vein so of course it's going to create a thrombus but we don't care about the superficial vein thrombus but we want to make sure there's enough gap or margin of error where if the thrombus is formed in the greater saphenous or the small saphenous vein it doesn't propagate all the way into the femoral vein into the iliac so that's what we're concerned about so here you can see we put a sheath in the vein the, the catheter goes all the way to the saphenofemoral junction right here and all we do is just turn, turn the catheter on and we just pull keep pulling the catheter back for every 20 second runs and the last catheter pull we take the sheath out and we're all done no suture no stitch required we just wrap it and we're all done this is one of the devices I was talking about is the Veno Seal, which is essentially no tumescence, meaning no lidocaine, no anesthesia required. It's non-thermal, so no energy generation is required, and it's a non-sclerosin, so it doesn't have any sclerosing agent like we talked about in the foam sclerosing phone therapy. So it's mainly an adhesive. It's like a glue. You put in a glue, it clogs up, it blocks the vein, and you're all done. So we've had we've used, we've used glues in the past, but uh, this is one of the widely used uh, glues, which is now uh, recently approved. It, it's known to have its uh, tissue adhesive uh, properties, its anti-microbial anti uh, effect as well. And this is one of the approved uh, venous seal closure devices which we use. Nowadays, so this you can see, this is the gun which has the glue in it, this is the catheter. So we again, the same concept of going next to the junction, pulling back. This, everything is ultrasound guided, but all you do is when you inject glue, you have to go slow because you don't want the glue to go down in the main vein. Because the problem, if it goes in the main vein, then you're stuck because you can't suck this glue out. It's like a, it's like a, it just sticks on to the vessel wall very quickly, so it's not like you can put somebody on anticoagulation. It's not a thrombus. It's actually a mechanical, physical uh, presence in the vein, so then you're in trouble and you might have to bring in suction, stent, or do other stuff. So just to go overview of how the study was approved in the US, 242 patients follow up. And again, like we always look for the success of the procedure being a closure rate. The closure rate was approximately 95.3%. So no uh, anesthesia, no burning sensation, no heat generation, it just glues off. And this is also, this is another technology, it's called the Clary vein. So it, it's a combination of mechanical, chemical, uh, venous closure. So what it does is it... Uh it's actually an infusion catheter. It has a tip with a rotating needle in it, so we put it again into the vein. The needle actually spins around and act, de destroys the intima. So it's like creating, it's like when you do a paint, you don't directly paint on it, you actually scrub the wall. It actually makes the wall rough and intima free, and then we inject the sclerosing agent. So the sclerosing agent just circles up and actually closes it uh, very effectively. So again, it's very, we don't require any local anesthesia or any generator pump or any heat generating instrument with minimal post-op uh, stuff. Uh, before I end, this is the newest uh foam injection, which is called Verithina, which is actually approved for the main bigger veins. It's a patented technology which has like the nitrogen microfoams in them. So what we do is inject these small bubbles in the in the veins, and it doesn't require any incision or general anesthesia. It's just uh, for any veins, tortuous veins. Sometimes if you have tortuous veins, you cannot put in your catheters because catheters are stiff. So in those cases, these uh, this sclerosing agent works great because it just takes the flow of the vein itself and you can uh, fix the vein up. So uh, this is one of the multi-center trials for the vein. It again shows that the quality of life, the the edema, the pain, the stress, and the uh, the um, uh, the the scoring the quality of life is much better with the uh, with the sclerosing agents. So just in conclusion, varicose veins very common disease entities heavily underdiagnosed. A lot of people have it. It's just about getting the awareness to the physician, to the clinician, to nurse practitioner, and to the patient. And uh, the treatment is very minimally invasive, 15 minutes outpatient procedure, excellent efficacy, and eff uh, excellent results even at five years. So multiple treatment options you can always discuss with patients and do the best for them. Thank you so much.